We're good. Okay, we are wrapping up our series this morning, One Church Values. We've taken the last six weeks and talked about things that we as a church value very much, highly value, helps guide and direct everything that we do. And this morning we're concluding by talking about the fact that we value mission. And this should come as no surprise. If you've been a part of One Church for any amount of time, you know that we love missions. We have been going every second year for I didn't know the answer to this. Anybody in house know how long we've been going to Mexico for? When was the first one? Pop quiz. I'll give you a new person gift if you know the answer. 2006 was the first one. Okay, 2006. So we've been going for a long time. It is actually that time we're going to be more proactive in the Mexico mission because it's in 2024 and we want to give lots of time for prep Here's my being proactive. If you are interested in joining the 2024 trip, I know that's a long ways out, but you know what? It, it'll be here before you know it. If you're interested in the 2024 trip, come talk to me. We'll start getting the list. We'll need your emails, so we'll keep you in the loop. And we're going to start prepping, planning fundraisers, because I don't like this whole panicked, month before thing that we've been doing. That's not working anymore. So uh, if you're interested in joining us, come talk to me. We will get it going. Um, interesting fact about missions. Man, it is loud in here this morning. It's awesome. It's exciting. <laughs> interesting fact about missions trips. Uh, back in 2012, there was a study done called the hemorrhaging faith. One of the things that has been happening was happening then and continues to happen today is we seem to be losing our young believers and what i mean by that is people who've been saved in the church raised in the church by 20 by the age of 25 we've lost 60 percent of them 60 percent have walked away from the church walked away from their faith want nothing to do with it and so this study was not so much about why did you leave but it's actually a study of those that stuck around why did you stick around? What was it about your early upbringing that made church and faith viable parts of your life? And there's two things that came out in common for most people. And one of them was a missions trip. Because if you've never been on a missions trip, if you have been on a missions trip, you know that nothing tests your faith, your patience, your personality, your relationships with your friends and your spouse and your past. Like, nothing gets tested better then when on, you're on a missions trip. But nothing makes your faith more alive than when you're on a missions trip because you are there for one purpose, to share the gospel with people who are in desperate need of it. And you're doing it through feeding and clothing and doing projects. And the missions trip has this hugely profound impact on the development of our early believers' faith. Does anyone want to guess what the second one was? And I'm really disappointed because Clay's not here to me to pump his tires. Summer camp. Summer camp was another one of those massively formative things where people come for a week long. Again, your faith is just bombarded with everything that the speaker has for you. You are surrounded by other believers, positive role models. So missions trips and camp are two of the most formative things we can do for our young people. So thus, again, missions trip 2024. Um, I forget what the age cutoff is, but we want to get our young people on that trip as well because these are those defining things that help develop us. But where do we get the idea of a missions trip from, from Scripture? Because obviously we don't want to just go off the rails, do our own thing. Where do we get this idea? And if you were raised in church, you're probably anticipating me to quote the Matthew 28 passage, but I'm not starting there. Matthew 28 is what is called the Great Commission. Jesus is ascending into heaven, and he is giving his apostles one last marching order, one last instruction about what you are to do with the faith that you have and the experience that you've had and everything that I've given you. This is what you're supposed to do with it. But even though this is the what we're supposed to do, it doesn't answer the question of why. Why do we do missions? Why do we follow the Great Commission? Why do we do what Jesus asked us to do. And actually, the why comes from Matthew 22, another passage that you probably could recite off the top of your head if you were raised in church. Matthew 22, starting in verse 37, 
Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. The two great commandments. Jesus said that all of scripture, everything that is taught, everything that you could do as a believer is summed up in these two things. Jesus said in John that if you love me, you will follow my commands. And what are the commands? They all get summed up right here. Love people, love God, and love people. And it makes sense when you've had a life-saving experience with Jesus. And what I mean by that is that you come to a place where you realize that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And you, you ask Jesus to become your Lord and Savior. You ask him to forgive you of your sins, cleanse you of all your wrongdoing. Jesus not only forgives you, wipes the slate clean, but also makes you a new creation says that he radically transforms you so that you look nothing like the person you were before. He changes the way you think. He changes the way you talk. He changes everything about you. And if Jesus had done such a radical and amazing thing in you, wouldn't you want to share that with the people that you love? If Jesus has radically transformed everything, wiped the slate clean, forgiven you of everything... Wouldn't you want to share that with the people you love so that they can experience it right along with you? And Jesus says it's not just the people that you want to love, the people that are easy to love, but that you are supposed to love everybody. And the greatest expression of this love is to share Jesus with as many people as possible. So love the Lord your God. God has given us his commands, his teachings, and the way that we love him is by following them wholeheartedly. And love people, how do we do that? Well, we share the experience we have with Jesus with as many people as we possibly can. Which brings us to Matthew 28, the Great Commission, starting in verse 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always even to the end of the age. So Matthew 19 is where we get the idea of missions. Go make disciples of all nations. To the ends of the earth you will go, and you will share the gospel. You will make disciples of everybody so that everybody can be a follower, be learning, have this relationship, this transformative, life-giving relationship found only in Jesus Christ. And why are you going? What is the confidence that you have to go? Well, Jesus says that I have been, he has been given all authority, he's been given all power, and that he will never leave or forsake you. So you may not have all the authority and power, but the Lord that walks with you and never forsakes you, he's got all the authority, he's got all the power, and he's there with you every step of the way. And so we walk in a greater confidence than maybe we have in ourselves because we know that we know that Jesus is with us. And this is all fine and dandy. We're we're all about missions. We're all about international. Let's go. Let's do this thing. But the interesting thing is, is that that's not actually the full instruction that we get from Jesus. It's often asked, why do we need four Gospels? Well, it's not four separate stories about Jesus. It's the same story told from four different perspectives. And each perspective adds different details that other guys left out, either intentionally or because of bad memory or whatever the reason is. Each gospel writer highlighted a different thing. Certain ones missed it and the other ones picked it up. And Luke adds to the commission. Luke adds to the story of what Jesus told his apostles just before he ascended. In Acts 1, we read this. So the apostles were with Jesus. They kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom. Okay, so before we move on, this is important. One of the things that the Jewish people believed was that the Messiah, who is Jesus, was going to be this conquering king, that he was going to command armies and that nations would be rallied around him. And one of the things the Jews were hoping is that when the Messiah came, he's going to destroy the Romans because the Jews were tired of being subjected to other empires. 
So they've been subjected to the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks, and now they're subjected to the Romans. And the apostles fully believed that Jesus was the awaited Messiah, and he wanted. Je- they were like, Jesus, is it time? Are you going to call down legions of angels and you're going to destroy the Romans? Because this is going to be awesome. And Jesus is like, well, I'm coming to establish a kingdom, but it's, it's not the one you think it's going to be. I'm not destroying the Romans to establish it because I've already started establishing it through you. Jesus replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those times and dates, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. One of the things Jesus says in the Gospel of John is that he has to ascend, he has to leave, in order for the Holy Spirit to come. Why? Because Jesus, just like you and I, was limited to a certain time at a certain place. He couldn't be everywhere all at once as long as he was on earth, but the Holy Spirit could. And so when Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit came. And when you become a believer in Jesus, not only do you get wiped clean, not only to become a new creation, but the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within you and gives you the gifts and the power. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead rests in every believer because the Holy Spirit is the stamp of your redemption. He is the mark that you have been set apart for great and marvelous things. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with this power You will be my witnesses telling people everywhere. But he starts very intentionally by saying you're going to start in Jerusalem. If Jesus was here and was giving us the same orders, the same lesson, the same commission, he would say, you're going to be my witnesses telling everyone everywhere, first in Carlisle or Redverse or wherever you're watching online, first in Carlisle, then Saskatchewan, And then Manitoba, and there's a little joke there, because the Jews and the Samaritans didn't like each other. So, you know, Saskatchewan and, you know, riders, blue bombers. Kevin, it's just a joke. Relax, okay? You don't have to be. (laughs) Kevin's at our Redverse campus. He's from Manitoba, and he gets fired up every time I pick on the bombers. So anyways, um, right? So we start in our, and then, you know, we've got to go to Manitoba, and, you know, we've got to share there. And then we go to the ends of the world. One of the things that always shocks me, I've been on so many missions trips with so many different groups. You'd think that this would be localized to one group from one church, but it happens every single missions trip. And you've been on a missions trip, you've probably had this conversation. This is usually how it plays out. You get to the end of the day, and you're sitting around a fire. It's always around a fire. I don't know why. That just seems to be the setting. And you're reflecting on the highlights of the day. What went well? Oh, I really appreciated this. Or I love talking to this person. Or I got to, you know, I prayed for this person. They got healed. Or, you know, we we talk about all the good things. At some point in the conversation, somebody stops and says, you know, it'd be really nice if we could do this back home. Right? All my mission trip goers, right? That happens every single time. Doesn't matter who's on the trip, and it's never the same person. It's always a different person being like, Oh, it'd be so good to be able to do what we're doing here, but do it back home. And what ends up happening? We get home and nothing ever happens. Because we get distracted by life, we get distracted by the pressures and the demands of home, and we, for, we just seem to forget about that conversation. But I think that conversation is significant because there's something really important happening there. There's something in us that says, why, am I, why do I have to go to another country to accomplish something that my own home needs just as much as the people in Mexico and the people in Barbados and the people in these other countries need? My, I got people in my own backyard that need this just as much as they do. What good is it to send teams to other countries to share the gospel of Jesus while our own neighbors haven't had the same opportunity? And some groups have said, well, it's because the church of the south is ripe and the harvest is easy and there's, God is moving so powerfully in the south. It's just, it's just easier to do the south. We'll just forget about the north. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say Jerusalem is too hard. Just go find somewhere else to go and be a witness. No, he said you start at home. 
Because you have been placed here for such a time as this. The people that are in your life are not in your life by accident. They're there for a reason, for a purpose. And I think one of the things that causes so much problems is that we've separated the idea of mission to just international. Right? Missions, whenever I say missions in church, we think about international. Oh, we've got to go to Mexico. We've got to go to Barbados. We've got to go to Kenya. We've got to go somewhere else. And we've got to... And what, well, but we do the same thing at home, but we don't call it mission. We call it evangelism. You know what happens when we call it evangelism? That's a scary word and nobody ever does it. Oh, I don't want to be part of that. I don't even understand what that word means. Or we do something really churchy and we call it witnessing. You know what happens when you type witnessing into Google? It autocorrects you because that's not a word. In church circles, it's a word. But outside, witnessing is not a word. And even Jesus didn't say, you're not going to go and witness to everybody. What did he say? You are witnesses. And what are you witnesses of? You are witnesses of how good God is. You are witnesses of Jesus' love. You are witnesses of Jesus' forgiveness and redemption and life transformation. Why are you witnesses of it? Because it has happened in your own life in radical ways. And, because it, and it's not just a one-time thing that you have to be like, oh, I don't remember all the details. But Jesus transforms you daily. Jesus speaks to you daily. He wants, he wants to refine you and make you better and form you into the man and the woman that he's called you to be daily. And you are witnesses of that. And you are to tell people about the goodness and the way that you have interacted with the Savior of the world. That's what you're supposed to tell people. And the scary part is, is I think sometimes we get so distracted doing the things of whatever the things of life that when people ask what's God doing in your life today we really have a truck we really have trouble coming up with an answer and we shouldn't our love for Jesus should be so overwhelming that is the first thing we do we wake up excited to see what God's going to say excited to see where God's going to lead us and just that that answer should be just right on the tip of our tongue that is what the mission of the churches. That's why we want strong families because our families are the biggest witness of how good God is because when God is moving in our families, we become this unstoppable force in our families. It's why we value community because if we have a strong church community as we're making disciples, right? It's the whole, we need a village to raise a child. Well, children in our faith, people who are young in the faith need this community to come and to learn and to be raised up and mentored and discipled to become the men and women that God has called them to be. So we value community, we value family, we value prayer because as good as I am at doing what I do, God's way better. And so we need to be praying more. We need to open our ears to hear what God has to say because God still speaks today. It's not something that we just read about and like, oh, God spoke to them back. No, God still speaks today. God still moves today. We, we follow a living God who wants to be involved in every aspect of our life. And so we pray. And we say, God, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts so that we can see what you're doing and hear what you're saying and be who you called us to be. We value teaching, biblical teaching. Why? Because the scripture is the foundation of everything we believe. God never contradicts himself. God won't contradict his word. God won't contradict what he said in the past. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we need the Bible to understand who God is, who we are in God's plan, and step into those great and marvelous things that God has called us to. See, all of these values that we have feed into this one big value. And it is the fact that we are on mission and we don't have to go to another country to be on mission. We just have to step out of the front door and we have entered the mission field. Because we have, so, we have people in each and every one of our communities. We have people in our province. We have people in our nation. We have people throughout the whole world, but right in our own community who don't know Jesus and when we talked about truth, we talked about how truth is the thing that opens our eyes to experience life to the fullest. Well, we believe that Jesus is the truth. We believe Jesus is the way, he's the truth, and he is the life. And without him, we are lost. We are grasping at straws. And so you are on mission every single day. You walk out the door 
to be a witness of what God is doing in your life, what God is at work and transforming and changing so that you can share it with others and invite them into the journey that you are on yourself. So with all that said, we're not going to call the worship team back up. We're going to do something a little bit different. Just like the prayer time, I'm going to put questions up. We're going to have table talk. If you come out on Wednesday, you know all about this. This is familiar ground for you. It's table talk time. I'm going to put questions up on the screen, and I invite you to take a few minutes, just talk about it amongst yourselves. We're going to turn on some music to fill some of the sound. But I invite you to take a few minutes, work through, talk about it amongst yourself. And because at your table, it's safe. It's a safe place to have this discussion. It's a safe place to say whatever comes to mind. It's a safe place to grow. And this is going to be one of the things that helps us grow. So here we go. Question, questions are up on the screen. I'm going to go turn on some music for you. Um, but discuss. You do not have 23 hours to talk about it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs>